Welcome in to the best in true crime podcasting. This is True Crime Tuesday. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. Today's show is going to be a little bit off the beaten path. And when I say that, I say that in the best way possible. I want you to imagine something for a moment. I want you to think about the people in your neighborhood. A little bit like that song uh, in Sesame Street, in The Electric Company, when you're talking about the people in your neighborhood, the people that you meet each day. And think about the way that we set it up in our childhood. You're supposed to think of everybody in the best possible light. You're supposed to think of everybody in their character. And we're supposed to think of the positives, accentuate the positives. But we don't always see people that way, do we? Sometimes you look at somebody and you think, oh, I really don't like this about that person. Or I don't like that about that person. Or people get together in groups and they start to talk. And they start to talk about the negatives about a person. Or they start to heap negatives on a person or maybe rumors start about a person and they start to cast dispersions about a particular person. What if I told you that that would lead to somebody having criminal charges put upon a person, even if they didn't do a thing? That's what we deal with in today's book, Zenith Man, Death, Love, and Redemption in a Georgia Courtroom. I have the actual lawyer and author of that book with me today. Our author and lawyer is McCracken Poston Jr. McCracken Poston Jr. is a practicing criminal defense attorney and former state legislator in the uh, Georgia House of Representatives. He's a graduate of the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga and received his law degree from the University of Georgia. He gained national attention for his handling of several notable cases that were featured on CNN Presents, Dateline NBC, A&E's American Justice and Forensic Files. He lives in Ringgold, Georgia. We're going to bring him in now. We're going to tell you exactly what we're talking about, and we're going to talk a little bit about Alvin, his client, and what exactly we're talking about here. McCracken, welcome to True Crime Tuesday. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. We're honored to have you, sir. Now, I start out the program that way because we've all had one person in our community that is that person, that person who we kind of all talk about in whispers. We all say, you know, there's something about that guy. Now, you've known Alvin, and and we should get out. Alvin's full name is... is Alvin Eugene Ridley. Okay. Now, we normally don't say three names unless they're guilty, right? And that's... (laughs) As you read the book, indeed. You're right. (laughs) But, But Alvin didn't start out necessarily as being the guy you would cast dispersions about. It, It... Give us a little bit of background about Alvin's early life. Well, what I know uh, comes from family. I grew up in the community north of Ringgold called Graysville. Uh, It was enough distance from the county seat to where uh, we did not immediately uh, sign on with uh, the aspersions that you were describing that people were casting. But Alvin was not doing himself any favors. Okay. He, uh, He went through school. Uh, somewhat bullied uh, by re- the report of some of his classmates. Um, he uh, he seemed to just always come back for more, and occasionally he would fight back. But uh, his fourth grade teacher told me, um, and this was 25 years ago when she was still alive, that he cried every day of fourth grade. Oh. I-, I didn't know what was making Alvin Ridley do the things that he did or said, say the things that he did. But all I knew was that he was, um, a a very frightened yet, uh, puffing his chest out and, and acting like he could take on the world kind of guy. Um, and it went on for years with litigation. Uh, he, he was a crackerjack TV repairman. Yeah. of the Zenith brand, which was a, a brand of, that uh, I think they the company still exists, but I don't know if they're making televisions anymore. But, uh, Tim, I don't know how old you are, but TVs used to be like furniture. Yeah. No, we, they had, were we had one. Big, I, yeah. uh, you know, there were some, they were always deep. There were no flat screens. Yep. And they would take up a whole dresser if you put one in your bedroom. 
uh, or they were in a giant, uh, beautiful wooden furniture box called a console. Yes, a console too. And yep. and they were so big that, and and they very often had problems because it was old school uh, analog type equipment. And uh, you would need a TV repairman. Mm -hmm. Well, Alvin opened up his Zenith franchise in Ringgold, Georgia in the 1970s, early 1970s. He was also uh, proudly married in 1966. Ringgold, Georgia is known for one, a couple of things. One, it's a, a, a Civil War uh, history place, the Battle of Chickamauga happened just uh, west of us in our in our county. Uh, but mainly what we're known for is the place where Dolly Parton and Carl Dean ran off to get married against her manager's wishes in 1966. Well, that's because of our proximity close to three other states, Alabama, Tennessee, and North Carolina, and our one-stop shopping marriage laws at the time. <laughs> you could come down in one place, get your blood test, get your license, and a judge would marry you. Oh, wow. Or one of the preachers in town was always available. So we had a steady stream of shotgun and every other type of marriage that was happening here. Uh, I don't know what uh, Dolly and Carl's story was, but it's a marriage that has lasted and still uh, goes on to this day. Oh, yeah. Well, three weeks after they married, Alvin shows up, uh, having just gotten out of the U.S. Army, uh, with a young girl that he had met from nearby our community on while he was on leave, uh, named Virginia Hickey. Now, Virginia was a somewhat uh, sickly young lady, uh, having severe epilepsy from childhood. She also occasionally had bad reactions to the epilepsy medicine. So she was a very delicate flower, as Alvin has described her before. Mm -hmm. And she, um, you know, they were married in 1966, uh, pretty soon after Dolly Parton got married. By 1969, when George Jones and Tammy Wynette slipped down to Ringgold to get married, wow. Virginia Ridley was missing. She was Nowhere to be found. Alvin Ridley was not being helpful on telling anyone, including her family, where she was. Her family began to take out, oh, let me see if I can get this right, newspaper articles. Yeah. Parents seek married daughter in the local newspaper and in the Chattanooga uh, Tennessee newspaper. Now, let me, let me uh, stop you right there, McCracken. Doesn't that seem odd to you? I mean, I know I realized the, the day and time in the, in the late 60s, but that parents would put out a newspaper article saying that they're seeking their married daughter. Wouldn't it seem obvious that that married daughter is probably one with her husband? And two, she's probably not too far away from the marital home. Well, Virginia, the marital home was a... Uh, Public housing, Ringgold's brand new public housing apartments. And this, this couple qualified for a two bedroom unit and they were very happy. Virginia's parents were very religious. Uh, this is uh, many people call the belt buckle of the Bible belt. And uh, Catoosa County at the time in my youth was a dry county. Okay. Now we could afford to be dry because we had the cheat of a state line very close. Ah, yes. Yeah. And you could just go right across the state line and get all the liquor, beer you wanted uh, and wine that you wanted. But we got to keep our piousness and saying, well, we're dry. <laughs> we don't do that. Well, her parents were very serious about alcohol and they raided the young couple's apartment looking for beer. Jeez. This so upset Virginia and Alvin, that they pretty much cut them off. Well, the parents got the last laugh because Alvin and Virginia were getting evicted from their apartment in 1970. The reason why the, the housing authority indicated, we don't think you're staying there all the time. And that violates, you know, the rules of having a two bedroom apartment 
that you're not there all the time. Well, the exterminator came in and made a move on Virginia when she was trying to take a bath. And so instead of a confrontation, which a lot of men would do, yeah. Alvin just simply decided, well, we're just going to get out of the apartment when we think that exterminator is going to run again. Sure. And so they weren't sure. So they would just basically leave every day, come back at night. Uh, meanwhile, her parents continued to look for her and they put up that, that type of article in the paper. And then lo and behold, the eviction happened. Now, guess who shows up at the eviction? Virginia's parents. So it's obvious that they knew something was going on and this was a way to flush Virginia out. Oh, man. Knowing Alvin as I do now, that would have been a trial to watch because he made it into somewhat of a circus. And um, finally, Judge Painter, who was just ending his career as I was beginning mine almost 40 years ago, uh, Judge Painter just said, we're stopping these proceedings. It was a jury trial for, for an eviction. That's classic Alvin move. Oh, my gosh. Judge Painter said, we're stopping this trial right now. Mr. Ridley, send for your wife. And so the, it, the, it was all culminating. And Alvin's father went and got Virginia, brought her into the courthouse. The judge would not even let Alvin go back into chambers, but took Virginia, her parents, and Alvin's father as his representative back into chambers where allegedly, and nobody is alive that was in that room anymore, but allegedly she said, when I married my husband, I became one with my husband. And I, I, that's where I want to be, you know, basically to her family, stop doing this. Yeah. You caused us to leave, leave my, lose my home. She was very upset about it. So, um, the parents really never tried again, but, and Alvin and Ridley, Al, Alvin and Ridley, Alvin and Virginia set up housekeeping in his parents' home in Ringgold, where Alvin grew up. And uh, they made accommodations, uh, um, uh, but everybody fit just fine in the household. Well, the problem is uh, her family continued to make some efforts to, to, to try to get her to come to things. When her father passed away, she did not go to his funeral. Um, her mother later went to a nursing home for years before she passed away. So when everybody in town forgot that she existed, uh, I don't think I ever knew that she existed. And, um, you know, I was about 30, eight, 39 years old at the time when she died oh, and nobody that I knew knew that she existed. Some of the older folks would say, well, I knew he got married, but seems like he told us she left him years ago. So Alvin was always thinking that the hickeys were behind all the questions. So even if a good friend asked him, where's your wife? He would think, oh, they've gotten to him. Right. And so he would come up with a big story to tell uh, that she went off to live in a hospital, that she went back, uh, moved out of state, just different things that in hindsight seemed suspicious as hell when she ended up dead on October 4th of 1997, ah, okay. 27 years and a month after her last public appearance in that courtroom in Catoosa County, Georgia. So obviously her siblings, some of them were quite young when they married, they picked up the mantle of the family lore and they shared it with everybody they could share it with, including the national examiner tabloid, uh, all the local public officials. And they, said it just as if it were fact. And it grew to the rumor that he kept her tied up. He kept her locked up in a in the basement when he was away working. And when he came home, he would release her. 
And it, just all of these different rumors were swirling around. Meanwhile, I had uh, I had been in Georgia legislature for four terms, mm-hmm. and I just had my butt handed to me in a great race for the U.S. Congress. I not only lost, I was destroyed. It it oh. it, it cured me of politics. <laughs> uh, and and um, at the same time, the uh, there there was a lot of change going on in Georgia at the time uh, when I served in the legislature. Georgia was a majority Democratic state. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it, that year, nineteen ninety six, when I was destroyed in the race, uh, the incumbent had been a Democrat but had switched parties after his last race, and so I joked in the book that uh, I, mine was one of the bellwether races and. So everybody started switching then. And Georgia, within one more cycle, maybe two, had gone completely red. And I joked that, yes, everybody's going to get their change, but the faces are going to be very familiar and the same. People were just switching the letter after their name. Yeah. So so in any event, I I was kind of down and defeated. I went also going through a divorce, which was a friendly one, if you could call it that. But it's still there's a sadness to a a, a loss of a plan, a life plan. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then I kind of had this presidential appointment dangled out there that I, of course, went for with gusto, only to have it kind of be slapped in the face with not getting that either. So I was 11 months into this new life that I was trying to figure out. And suddenly Virginia Ridley dies. Everybody thought it odd. But odder still was I started seeing Alvin Ridley on the street near my office for three days in a row after her death, three uh, weekdays in a row, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. By Wednesday, I actually spoke to him. Because my family knew him. My sister went to high school with him, Okay, my oldest sister. My father was one of his loyal customers. My father loved shopping where it was the cheapest he could get it. Okay. And, uh, and, and he was, uh, Alvin provided us uh, Zenith televisions, and uh, he repaired them. I tell a story in the book when I was about 13 or 14. I was at home watching wrestling. My sisters and I had worn the tuner knob off the TV. It was a metal crescent pin Mm -hmm. with a plastic knob on it. Right. And so by twisting it and flipping it, 3912, 3912, the Chattanooga stations, we wore it out. And I was doing just fine with a small pair of channel lock pliers. <laughs> but uh, I, my mother apparently waved Alvin on into the house from the garden. And suddenly I've got this strange man in the house watching wrestling over my shoulder. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I forgot all of this until later a conversation with Alvin during the representation where he told me the same story he told me then, which impressed me at age 13. Sure. It was that he had met Andre the Giant. Oh, wow. Behind the Memorial Auditorium in Chattanooga where they had the Saturday night wrestling matches. And Alvin told me that what he eats for breakfast. He told me what he eats for breakfast and it was some outrageous amount of eggs Uh and a couple of loaves of bread and, and, you know, a giant slab of bacon or something like that. And, and so I, um, I went to school and told everybody, you know, Hey, I know a guy that knows Andre the giant. And I've told all my friends that story. And then fast forward decades and Alvin's telling me the story again. And I said, you're that guy. I, you've told me this story before, and uh, and I and I believe Alvin in in his stories like that because many of them are self depreciating. Yeah, Alvin, uh, and later I learned his wife. For every ounce of suspicion they had against local officials and against local government, they had a counterweight of pounds in faith in the federal branches of government. Isn't they that thought something? the federal government was their salvation. So imagine early in the representation, 
Alvin and I are fighting. Mm-hmm. We're fighting, and and I, it, I, I guess I should go ahead and disclose that only three years ago, mm-hmm. 22 years after the trial, did I learn that Alvin Ridley is neurodivergent, that he is on the autistic spectrum. Yeah. Had I known that 25 years ago, it would have probably been a lot smoother sailing between attorney and client. Oh, sure. Because of my childish issues, I'm a micromanager, neurotic micromanager that wants to make everything right and everything smooth. And I go into the book of why I think I became that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that is the worst person to try to work with a neurodivergent person, you know, (laughs) like because I'm demanding that he do things and and he's resisting. And we were like that just over a year. Mm -hmm. Uh, Alvin, you got to let me in your house. Oh, I'll think about it. You let every cop that showed up in, let your lawyer in. I told you I'll think about it. You know, it was just (laughs) like that constantly. And, uh, you know, I I decide to, because he's going to phone booths and calling me at all hours of the night, uh, I just said, look, Alvin, you know, my phone was Atlanta-based. I said, I'm going to get your phone reinstalled in your house. Mm -hmm. I'll pay the bill. That way you can call me on my cell. And, you know, I turned it off at night. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but uh, you know, I said, you don't, you don't have to, we don't have to operate this way. Well, I line up the phone company. I'm paying for everything. I'm going to be paying his phone bill. And uh, Kevin, the guy, the installer, uh, he and I had a plan that I was going to go with him and I was going to have a camera and I was going to use the opportunity to shoot photos of the house. Well, Alvin figures me out, as he always did, Mm -hmm. and insists that the new phone is going to be installed on the porch, therefore denying me access for several months later. I only got access when, and, and it was just an unusual thing that I don't know if my parents knew this or they were just being good out of the goodness of their heart. But they um, said, son, we want you to take a turkey plate from our Thanksgiving spread here to Alvin. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have anyone. And, you know, that was the last place I wanted to go on Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. I had remarried my my wife, my second wife. She was from Ringgold. So she grew up with all the rumors about Alvin. And she was a little worried about me being with him so much. But I took her home and I took the turkey plate to his house. Well, I later learned that Alvin is very transactional. When I show up with a delicious smelling uh, tin foil covered plate, he felt that he needed to give me something in return. So he invited me in his home, Thanksgiving day, 1998. And when my eyes adjusted to this really unpleasant interior, I began to see that he had created a shrine of sorts on one wall, almost covering an entire wall with writing uh, in a very distinct hand. And my heart jumped because I wanted it to be Virginia's, but I didn't want to, you know, his mother had lived there. His father had lived there and he had lived there. So I said, Alvin, um, when my eyes adjusted to it, I noticed there were poems, there were recipes, there were was kind of a loose leaf diary with all kinds of different dates on it. The the if if it wasn't dated, you could easily date it by some of the things that she wrote. Neil Armstrong walked on the moon today, you know things like that. And and I said, Alvin, is there more? He took me to the side room where it was in cardboard boxes stacked to the ceiling. Whoa. I estimated there were 15,000 plus entries just by how many I had in my stack and then kind of multiplying it out. She, She explained everything. But then Alvin said, but you can't have it. 
Oh. That's, that's all I've got left of her. So you read the things I had to go through mm -hmm. to Alvin and I by accident. He was starting to scream about the biggest conspiracy in his world was in one of his counterclaims or one of his lawsuits. There was a counterclaim by a law enforcement officer who got a judgment or they thought they got a judgment against Alvin and they levied against a 1977 Chevy van, <laughs> yes. which became the focal point of Alvin's complete obsession with the government. They did it wrong. And Alvin was smart enough to figure that out. And he got the van returned three weeks later. Yet Alvin refuses to accept it. And I just want you to see, this is today, Alvin pointing to that van, which has not been touched in oh 40 my years. God. Look he at refuses that. to accept it under some understanding that well, there's a statute of limitations that would begin if he accepted it back. What stat now I read that in the book, McCrack. What statute of limitations does he think starts up if he touches he, that van? The, the one that he would keep him from suing them for taking his van. There's an inner logic. There's an in, there's an inner working logic of Alvin that once you've been around him, you can kind of get. He says, "Well, I haven't accepted it back, so therefore, I can sue them for taking it." Well, they took it in 1984. It was gone for three weeks, but that's where he focused his obsession was the van. That's all he wanted to talk about. I'm saying, Alvin, this is a murder case. We need to talk about your wife. Oh, no, we don't, because I didn't kill her. But they did take my van. And oh. so that was his logic. And that's what I was running headstrong up against. So and uh, just, just for the listeners who are listening on audio, to describe what we just looked at, if you can just imagine vines covering, <laughs> covering, a van or, or or just just imagine a block that you can't see just something out of Indiana Jones where there are vines and trees covering something that you can imagine might be a van in the forefront of it and it just being completely covered by vegetation that's what Alvin is pointing to you can't make out that it's a van no and I'm sorry about this terrible picture no no but, you're uh, you're fine I can see it perfectly there, and and there is there is a uh there's a picture from 25 years ago that's much better because the trees had not grown on all sides of it yet. But, um, and that's, he was, you know, carping about the van then. And, uh, and that's, that was the, 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 the epitome of insult to him was the van. Well, here's Virginia's writings. And one of them, uh, not on the wall, but buried down in the boxes of her writings, was a proposed script that she wrote to the TV show Unsolved Mysteries. The subject was that the county took their van. <laughs> so she, she was sharing his paranoid view of the world. I actually think she was behind a lot of the litigation because I found glossaries that she would write out for him about what legal terms meant. And, and then he would get on his uh, trusty old typewriter. He used to post these missives on the inside of the glass of the the shuttered TV shop, because when the van got taken, he decided that's it. I can't work anymore. And he shut the place down. It just started just falling apart. Well, Truth be known, Alvin will almost admit today that it was the advent of solid state circuitry that did him in. Oh, my gosh. No longer were people buying the old giant console TVs. They began to be cheaper. They began to be thinner. They began to be bigger Yeah. And to what we have today, which were, you know, phenomenal things. Yeah. But have you ever tried to get one fixed? 
No. Oh, well, you can't. Yeah. But, but Target or Walmart will say, uh, we're not taking that back. Uh, we'll just replace it or just go ahead and throw that away. We'll, you know, pick you up another one. And, and Alvin kind of laments that nobody needs a TV repairman anymore. Yeah. So, uh, so in his yard, uh, and again, these are from today on the ground. There's a bunch of picture tubes. Oh my God. That, that's my photographer friend, Emily and her friend Lily. And they're back there taking pictures. And those are, those are picture tubes. They look like alien pods wow. from uh, the, another planet that, you know, got landed here. Uh, wow. But those are screened down picture tubes, you know, coming up out of the ground. That is crazy. So, so anyway, Virginia, she wrote so much, I really needed to get it proven to be her handwriting. So Alvin gave an exemplar repeating things that the handwriting a uh, expert told him to write. I had official signings from his mother on a lot of the litigation. Alvin's mother joined him. His father was out in the community, a stonemason. So there were plenty of known or notarized things that he signed, uh, but hardly anything of Virginia. But I remembered, well, they did get married. Mm -hmm. Luckily, her maiden name was Hickey with a Y on the end. And so she kept the same way of writing the Y on the end of Ridley. It was a very, uh, uh, it had a, it was a pretty handwriting. It, she, she really added flourish to the, the lower descending parts of letters. And so, uh, but Alvin and I had this constant fight over whether I could use them or not. Oh. So meanwhile, this is his autism. Right. And right. me responding to it in the worst possible way. No. Me, you know, yelling at him, telling him, you know, he's going to mess up. Meanwhile, his notion that the federal government is going to save him starts popping up. And that's first was that's a crazy. Call. I tell you what, I tell you what, McCracken, let's take our break here. When we come okay. back, let's talk a little bit about that push and pull between you and Alvin. And let's get a little bit into what's going on with this struggle between he and the local authorities. I think I find that that struggle fascinating and why and, and what exactly happened on that fateful day that that Virginia passes away because he he handles it in a very unusual way. And I, and it has everything to do with the, the conflict that he has on the local level that you're talking about. And Absolutely. his, and his belief in the, in the national authorities and the tumultuous relationship he has on the local level. And it is bizarre. I mean, it's, it's just bizarre. <laughs> and, and we'll get to it. Like, like McCracken says here, McCracken Poston Jr. Is our guest. He is the the lawyer for Alvin Ridley and the author of Zenith Man, Death, Love, and Redemption in a Georgia Courtroom. We have a link to it in the description of this program. I encourage you to go out and get it during the break. When we come back, Alvin Ridley, that fateful day with his wife, Virginia, and when she passes away, and why things developed the way they developed, and his relationship with the local authorities, and why things developed the way they developed. When we come back... Why did Alvin take the path he took? When we come back on the best in true crime podcasting. This is True Crime Tuesday. Welcome back to the best in true crime podcasting. This is True Crime Tuesday. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. Our guest is McCracken Poston Jr. He is the author of Zenith Man, Death, Love, and Redemption in a Georgia Courtroom. He was also the legal representation, the lawyer for Alvin Ridley. Now, before the break, McCracken, we were talking about Alvin Ridley and this contemptuous relationship he has with local authorities in his area. Everybody, it seems like everybody who might potentially have a fingerprint along the way in this case, he had some sort of tumultuous relationship with. doesn't matter who it was. And he obviously didn't trust me. Right. 
it, here I came from government, mm-hmm. and uh, maybe it's because I lost that he thought he could trust me. Uh, I mentioned the van. Oh yeah. Here's oh. from another. Here's from another angle. Him showing it to me in 1999. Oh my gosh. Now the the other angle you saw was from down the hill looking back up. Yep. But it it has not has not been touched in now this year forty years. Jeez. And and he's very confident about his his lo- logic. It was almost you remember the cartoonist uh, Rube Goldberg. Yeah. Who would who would create fantastic causal connections from something to something completely different, and and he would create it would be a machine that would make things a you know, ball roll and uh, light a match, which would, you know, burn a string and, you know, and all these things. That's kind of the way Alvin's mind put together conspiracies and causal connections between a fender bender car accident that his dad had in the company truck to his father's death two years later of pancreatic cancer. Alvin insisted that it had something to do with the accident. So he and his mother began to sue everybody. Well, his mother was signing on. Mm -hmm. Virginia was nowhere to be seen publicly, of course, because they were uh, trying to uh, keep her family from flushing her out. And um, so uh, they made big mistakes, though. Uh, Alvin... Poor mouths, as we call in the South, when you always speak that you are pitiful and need everybody's assistance. Alvin was an ace poor mouther. And he he and his mother wrote a letter to uh, the Department of Family Services telling how horrible things were. And it's because his father died of this car wreck. And uh, his mother wrote that he promised me two new dresses and a new refrigerator before he died. And that's all I want out of this thing. <laughs> well, social services decided, well, we better go check on this lady. She's saying that she's destitute. Well, Alvin and his mother were so offended that the government was coming to check on his mother that they basically invited in with their letters <laughs> that it became a big hullabaloo with Alvin uh, escaping with his mother across the state line and taking her to a Chattanooga hospital where the hospital said, look, this lady's fine. She obviously wants to be with her son. And they told the Georgia authorities, you know, we are going to, we have tested her. She's competent. She's, she's where she wants to be. So, but this just added to the paranoia. Well, Alvin is in my office and my secretary said, well, the congressman just called. Well, this is Congressman Nathan Deal, who had just beat the hell out of me just, mm-hmm. uh, you know, less than two years before. And Alvin kind of sat up straight in his chair like, this is important. And I thought, oh, gosh, you know, knowing Alvin, he probably thinks it's about him and uh, yeah, all of his woes. Well, I, I, I think, well. Alvin even says, ain't you going to call the congressman? So I thought, well, okay, I'll at least impress Alvin Ridley. So I called, had the phone to my ear, thankfully. And the first thing out of Congressman Nathan Deal's mouth is, keep Alvin Ridley away from my congressional offices. (laughs) He's scaring the ladies there. Well, I, I immediately felt empathy because I already knew that telling Alvin that he could not now trust the federal legislative branch that would be devastating to him oh sure so i called him outside walked him to his car and acted like i was trying to tell him something confidentially and i said alvin you know that nathan deal that damn congressman he hates me you know that don't you and he's looking kind of bewildered and i said you know the election well he really looked bewildered then because he knew i was beaten badly so why would this guy have a problem with me I said, Alan, he he said that if you or I ever show up to his congressional offices again, he's going to just have us both arrested. And Alvin, I can't I can't afford to be arrested. It would just be devastating. But if you'll just cooperate with me and help me help you when this is all over, 
I'll take you to and show you where he lives. <laughs> <laughs> and that was sat, that satisfied Alvin because I wasn't piling on and saying, you stay away. You stay away from that guy right. because I'm telling you, I've made it into a secret plot that, you know, <laughs> he won't be able to hide from you, Alvin, when I take you to his house and let you out. You know, that was the, <laughs> of course, I had never had any idea, plan to do that. Nathan Deal was a nice guy with a nice family, and I would have never done that. But, um, and he actually redeems himself by the end of the book, by the acknowledgments. And uh, so, Alvin, I just had to find accommodations, such as when Alvin would start talking about his van and his voice would elevate when my voice would elevate, and we would end up screaming at each other. And I found that he did better if there was a woman around. So my secretaries often suffered in having to sit with us mm -hmm. in the room because he was very, very uh, calm and polite around women his mother had raised him so yeah um but uh one day he was in there and he started in on the van and i was just so exasperated i just said oh lord well he fell silent he thought i was praying oh and so i rolled with it yeah i just picked up and started praying my legal advice to him and that was one calm way because he was very respectful of church customs and you know he he was uh when you ask about alvin's denomination yeah he's everything okay. he's everything because he will go to every church in the county and <laughs> beg until they ask him not to come back anymore so he apologized to a retired baptist preacher in ringgold during a book signing his uh granddaughter brought a book for for alvin to sign and alvin said I need to apologize to him. And I said, why? And he said, well, I, I rode by on a bicycle one day and flipped him off. Oh, no. Uh, you know, <laughs> this is after they told him, quit bringing up fixing your mother's roof. You know, we've given you enough money to fix it over three times. Oh, Just my please, gosh. Please drop it. Just drop the poor act. And, and so... Uh, <laughs> You know, Al, we started finding ways to work together. The praying of the legal advice, uh, of course, as I wrote in the book, by the time the trial was going on, I was really praying. Yeah. Because I I, I knew in my heart that he was completely innocent at that point. Um, a couple of things happened. The state crime lab was basing its entire uh, evidence on Alvin on the presence of petechial hemorrhaging around Virginia's eyes and mouth. Well, you can get petechial hemorrhages, tiny blood vessels rupture, from a coughing fit. You can get them from a seizure. Alvin had been telling them about her seizure that night, and he thought she was over it. She told him she loved him. And he wakes up the next morning, and she's on her face, which is not a good way to sleep if you're prone to seizures. And uh, the, the working theory for us was that she seized during again during the night and suffocated herself. Um, however, there was an epilepsy expert that I found that said you can even die of epilepsy without having that type of seizure, but obviously from the presence of the petechial hemorrhages, she probably had one. Mm -hmm. Well, the state of Georgia was saying, oh, no, you get those from asphyxiation of a manual kind, and we think he smothered her or he softly strangled her. And I was, I really didn't have anything until I found the, the writings. But a month before I found the writings, the Olympic track star Florence Griffith Joyner died in September, actually two months before I found the writings. Okay. September of 1998. Mm -hmm. By October, I didn't make much note of her passing other than just what a loss. This incredible yeah. athlete of just, you know, very stylish, very beautiful, extremely fast, uh, 
I was disappointed that she didn't run in the Olympics. I later learned it's because of a seizure disorder that she had. Yep. And um, I had to have her autopsy. Yeah. To compare it to Virginia's. Somehow I got the Orange County medical examiner to share the autopsy with me to use at trial. And if, if Virginia Ridley was murdered, then Flojo was brutally murdered. That's the way I put it to the jury. Because uh, the markings were in the same place. They were just a lot more, you know, profound. And, um, and Virginia's delicate state could explain why, you know, hers, hers uh, were slightly different. So uh, we suddenly had all this going for us. But the understanding for uh, Alvin was because I was I didn't know why Alvin was the way he was. Mm -hmm. I was really worried about going through this give and take on the stand where I'm asking him about his wife and he wants to talk about a van that the county took in 1984. Right. And so nothing much came in about Alvin in the trial, um, Alvin had me hire one guy, the one person that Alvin got excited about the aspects of his case was this. I don't know whether I can call him a doctor, but he was an <laughs> expert witness who seemed to be just the answer to all prayers. He, he I already had the theory for months of how Virginia died. But they were making a big deal over the state of the bed in the house that it looked like only one person was sleeping on it. And, um, of course, we countered that that was a bed that was up against a corner and there's no sofa in the room. Right. So if you wanted to watch TV, odds are several family members for years sat on the edge of the bed, sure. therefore sinking it, sinking it in a little bit on one side. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Ridleys were not big on flipping the mattress uh -huh. or washing the sheets. So no. or uh, I put two pillows into evidence that Alvin insisted that I put in. They were so rank, but I marked them collective defense exhibit 79 collective. No. And uh, one time I was in his house a few years ago and, Defense Exhibit 79 Collective is still laying on the bed being used. Oh, no. And with the big Sharpie of my Sharpie mark on it. Oh. So. Uh, have, they, have they been but, washed? But, but, I, but I began to realize that Alvin really couldn't help the way he was. Yeah. I feel terrible about, and I wrote everything about the book that's even negative about me in terms of my frustration with him, where I would lash out at him and i lashed out once about uh the apparently the fact that he does not bathe mm -hmm. and i immediately felt bad i immediately felt bad about even raising it and that's when i wrote in less than 30 hours i think I, i'm not sure the timeline my office was besieged by a skunk which sprayed up through the vent on all the case files on me because I was practicing an Alvin method of getting rats out of his house and his car. And uh, I got skunk sprayed in the face and uh, it got on everything. And I realized the next day when Alvin complained about how I was smelling <laughs> that we can't always help our circumstances. Alvin's neurodiversity or neurodivergence uh, makes him not enjoy the feel of water on his skin. Right. It's not an unusual aspect of someone on the autism spectrum. Yeah. And, and so uh, now that I know that only three years ago, I feel terribly guilty about the expectations. It's autism is a processing issue. Mm -hmm. 
I was asking Alvin and phrasing things and using a lot of nonverbal cues that were just flying right over his head. It's a processing matter. And at the same time, I was not processing Alvin because I did not know what was making him tick or not tick in some instances or tick too much on some subjects. So the, my book is a call to action there are five and a half million people with autism that have not been diagnosed still out there. We're doing a great job of identifying and diagnosing with school children now. Yes. Especially the public schools. Public schools are fantastic. Yes. And, and in catching things and applying the proper services so that that child will get the best, best chance at, uh, and of course, we've we've had uh, people on the spectrum since time began. And in fact, some of our greatest contributors have been on the spectrum. And and Alvin was a hell of a TV repairman. Nobody. Nobody complained about his TV repair. Right. He, he, he tells about one lady who was mad because she kept getting a shadow on one channel out of Chattanooga and complained about Alvin to the Better Business Bureau, but then called and took it back when the next two TV repairmen she tried could not solve the issue and told her it's because of a mountain she was up against that was, you know, making the signal not clear. And so she she reversed her bad, better business bureau rating. Oh, and wow. uh, but otherwise, Alvin was just he was in his element when he was selling TVs and working on TVs. And it was, it was horribly sad when, you know, things went the way they did. And his father died. His mother got weak and, and feeble. Uh, Virginia was his best friend. She wrote down everything that she cooked every night. Mm -hmm. She wrote down stories that Alvin would tell her when he came in from the community. But most importantly, she wrote what I called the, 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 the certain documents that were so important that I thought I'm going to have to steal them from Alvin to make sure I have something. And these two or three documents are so critical. There's one where Virginia references that they don't ever go out and she's it's, she's talking about the housing authority manager uh, who of course was in cahoots with her parents asking why she never went out the same letter this is this is her letter yep. in the book yep uh the same letter references uh the problems with her family and also that she spoke to Sheriff Leroy Brown, uh, like the Jim, Jim Croce song, Bad, Bad Leroy Brown yeah. was our sheriff. And, uh, <laughs> and she referenced that. And that was, that was gold. We, this, you know, this one document could have quit Alvin because it, it, it was right in the face of the rumor that this woman had been locked in a basement for almost 30 years. Uh, she wrote in the margins of Bibles and I ha had to read through all of it. And I found her notation of September of 1977. God told her to stop taking her medicine. Again, Virginia would sometimes have reactions to her medicine. And I think that may have been what was behind that. Well, the state of Georgia put up a, a dear friend of both mine and Alvin's, just a kindly elderly pharmacist who had a very short rich records retention record, apparently, and a short memory. And they put him up to testify that Alvin had never gotten medicine from his pharmacy. Well, when you have a client like Alvin, he never throws anything away. <laughs> we had bottles you know, from that pharmacy. And 
after September of 1977, when God told Virginia to quit taking her medicine, we had several months of full bottles. So she's, you know, he kept getting it for her and she just hung with it and decided I'm not, I don't, you know, stop getting it for me. I'm, I'm not going to take it. Well, she lived 20 years without medicating. And of course she did have some terrific seizures in the meantime, but she didn't have to deal with the, the way the medicine was making her feel. Yeah. Now, obviously I would have loved for Virginia to have continued to get, maybe try new medicines. Right. But she had made up her mind that she didn't want to go out. She didn't want to see anybody. And now I could prove it. That's amazing. That's amazing. You had, uh, without getting too deep into it, because again, I, I do want people to read this book. Again, the book is Zenith Man, Death, Love, and Redemption in a Georgia Courtroom. You were able to, McCracken, put together all these different things, such a strong case, in your case, to show that everything that was wrong with Virginia had nothing to do with murder, but everything to do with epilepsy. Absolutely. Was, and, and, and what's amazing is my epilepsy expert, uh, because you're paying these people to, you know, come down and you're putting them up in a hotel and you're paying them, you know, for their time on the stand. So you just bring them in the night before you take them out to dinner to talk about the case, Dr. Braxton Bryant Wanamaker. What a, what a great name. Yeah. From Orangeburg, South Carolina. He was a neurologist, but in the old internet, the old 1998 internet, I found him on a common name on abstracts about sudden death and epilepsy. And he seemed to be the world expert in it. And so I found him through directory assistance, old school, uh, called him up and sent him stuff about the case. And I said, you know, I really feel like she could have gotten these from a seizure. He said, absolutely. My, my patients come in and they've, they're covered with petechial hemorrhages. And he says, absolutely. This, this is a seizure related uh, look. Her hyoid bone, which is a very delicate bone in the neck, which usually breaks in a strangulation. It was intact. Um, the other than the, some damage that the coroner's assistant did trying to get blood out of the corpse, there was no damage to the neck at all. No bruising other than what they had done. So, it was truly just town rumor that unfortunately made it to the crime lab, which influenced that crime lab doctor to say, you know, let's, let's say homicide. Mm -hmm. And, and when there was plenty of doubt, uh, and so it was our job to highlight that doubt, but at the same time, I felt I needed to prove Alvin innocent. Right. The state has the burden. They didn't carry the burden. So be it. He's not guilty. But I wanted to show that he's not only not guilty, he's actually innocent. Right. right. And and so uh, Dr. Wanamaker, just as, as, a, as an aside, we're leaving. We're departing to see him the next day in the courtroom. And he said, is there anything else unusual about this woman? And I said, yes, she could not, you know, have a thought without writing it down. And he said, that's hypergraphia. It sometimes accompanies a, a temporal lobe epilepsy. He said, it's nothing, it doesn't affect what she writes. It just tells her to write it. And it explained, it was one of the big last things that needed explaining. Why would this woman obsessively write on everything? When she ran out of notebook paper, she had plenty of spiral bound notebook notebooks, but she also had loose box tops, cereal boxes that were cut open and had the, the non-printed inside. She would put ink to those usually and pencil to other things. She wrote poems. She wrote about TV shows. She had a fangirl obsession 
with TV's Ron Howard <laughs> from May from Mayberry, from Happy Days, now is distinguished producer and director. She gathered everything she could about Ron Howard. And think about it. Ron Howard always played wholesome characters. Yeah. And Virginia watched the Waltons and she watched happy days and she watched Andy Griffith's show. And so, you know, these were things that made Virginia happy and she wrote about them later. Wow. And so it was, uh, it was just pretty. Now Alvin insisted on keeping the evidence when I finally convinced him, well, I had to pay him to copy it. I had yeah. to give him two hundred dollars. That was transaction. A, transactional. Transactional, right? Like you I said. had to pay him two hundred dollars to copy it. Yes. During the copying, I, he would shuffle it up, and it wouldn't be the stacks that I'd left at his house for copying, <laughs> because he was second guessing me. He and this character named Salesman Sam, who he truly thought was his first chair legal advisor. <laughs> and this guy sold items out of a catalog, out of his bicycle basket. It was <laughs> utter humiliation that I had to bend to the legal advice of salesman Sam on occasion. <laughs> so uh, Alvin insisted on keeping the evidence in these god-awful giant suitcases that he would lug into court. Meanwhile, he's wearing a neck brace as if he had had a, he's faking a car accident. <laughs> uh, part of Alvin's psychological profile was that he has uh, somatization, which he, in, he imagines that he has great pains all over his body, but it's all psychological. So in any event, uh, he's keeping the evidence in these giant suitcases. And I'm not giving anything away that, wasn't said on forensic files by the juror cockroaches started coming out of these suitcases oh. by the droves. We unleashed every day scores of cockroaches into this courtroom. Well, talk about divine intervention or something spooky. The judge whose office was right next to that courtroom said, we're moving this trial to the adjacent old building, the old courthouse, the 19." 39 grand courtroom and we're going to finish the trial in there. Well, that was the last place Virginia Ridley had ever been seen in public oh, during wow. that eviction. And it was eerie. I'm not a big, I know you've got a whole channel for ghost issues and things yep. like that. Yep. I'm not a big follower in that kind of line of thought, but I got chills. Hmm. The realization that we're in this big old courtroom where I can talk about the last place she walked in public. And uh, it was just absolutely uh, just, just chilling to reunite her with her writings, her spirit with her writings. And I, I really, truly think that uh, this trial is the best evidence I've ever seen of she helped Alvin. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, we had a disastrous witness that just made me so low that I really just wanted Alvin and Salesman Sam and this little following of church people that had started to, you know, his latest church. <laughs> uh, I just said, y'all sit there by yourself. I'm just going to sit over here and I'll get your bill. But just, you know, enjoy your company, Alvin. Well, I completely missed that Jesus showed up during that lunch and it ordered him to testify. So, you know, Georgia, a defendant in probably most states because of constitutional considerations, a defendant is the sole person to decide whether they testify or not. I just had it understood with Alvin that he was not. Mm -hmm. Because I thought the jury would be totally offended and put out with the fact that he didn't seem that upset and that he's obsessed with his van being taken 15 years before. Well, just the fact that he would get up there and rant would, oh, would, gosh, look, yeah. would look adversarial. 
Well, turns out Jesus is a pretty good legal advisor. <laughs> Alvin, his testimony was nothing short of beautiful hmm. because I wasn't prepared. I wasn't over prepared. I just let him tell his story and let the chips fall where they will. We're going to talk about that van being taken. We're going to talk about daddy's truck wreck that led to the lawsuit that led to the counterclaim that led to the van being taken. We're going to talk about that damn eviction and how that wrong they were done then. But then I got to tell the jury, she was standing right here. She walked back into the judge's chambers, the same place it is right now. And from that day forward, her parents never tried to force her hand again. And it was eerie because, uh, but I knew we were probably in good shape when jurors were laughing, <laughs> um, especially with things that Alvin would say. Yeah. And I was so proud because uh, we went through all this ancient civil litigation, which even the state was bringing up. They were trying to show him to be a kind of a con man fraud. And I'm showing him to be an affected person with something, uh, that paranoia for sure, who, who, you know, just thinks of the world in a different way than we do. And, um, so I was so proud. I realized Alvin, you know, this lawyer started this lawsuit, but you fired him. This one started this one and you, they left. I think I'm the only person to stick with you from the beginning of a matter to the end. And I was kind of proud of myself. And he says, so far, <laughs> meaning that I could be fired any minute. Well, the jurors were laughing at my expense. And and I realized, you know, this guy's got perfect timing. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but he was very serious when he talked about the eviction. Yeah. And, and he was very serious about all these things. So, so in any event, Alvin was acquitted. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the most touched I've been by reviews and people commenting on the book have been people who have a neurodivergent person in their household. Yeah. Because I didn't know how they would take my own frustration with Alvin. And the point is they've lived that. Yeah. Yeah. They've 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 been there and they don't want people to just shy away and not talk about it. They 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 like feeling what I was going through out of frustration for somebody they're trying to help until they learned that they were neurodivergent on the spectrum. And so uh it, it's been fantastic. I, I just am so touched by it the way people have reacted to this book or the way you've reacted, Tim. You know, I absolutely loved it, McCracken. It's, it's one of those things where, you know, you, you don't know. Uh, first of all, I'll give you credit for this. You, you took on the case knowing that there was really nobody in the community who was going to be there for him. So you, you, you took it upon yourself. Let me tell you what gave me fuel to, I would get to points where I would think I have made the biggest mistake of my life because now I'm going to have another big loss simply because this guy's going to not show up to court and be tried in absentia or, or he's going to come to court and people are going to think what a cold hearted dude, you know? And, uh, what gave me my new resolve was the congressman calling. Yeah. Because suddenly I thought, now it's a game. Oh, sure. You know, now yeah. now I have only one constituent to worry about instead of, you know, hundreds of thousands. I've got one constituent to worry about, and that's, uh, I can do this. And, and Alvin was, uh, over time, you know, he got more cooperative in some ways. Um, but I'll tell you, in the last three years since his uh, diagnosis of being on the spectrum, being neurodivergent, Alvin has blossomed. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if he realizes 
Well, first place, the community has blossomed in there the way they treat him. Mm -hmm. Alvin is like a superstar in our community now. People want his signature a bit more than they want mine. <laughs> and uh, when we have a book signing, if I have it within 100 miles, Alvin's going to be there because people are disappointed that he's not. He's uh -huh. charming. He's, they, they Now, when he gives them the blank stare and gives a, a one-word answer, they think it's delightful oh sure. and they just you know giggle and hug him and uh, you know and uh we were about to go to a barnes and noble to a book event and he wanted a hamburger so i went to a place called red robin which is right next mm -hmm. to barnes and noble and mm -hmm. i hadn't been there since my children were very small and uh i realized why when i went back in there <laughs> but alvin was eating his hamburger and and I was telling the people sitting around us who he was and what we were about to do. The server came over and she couldn't believe it. She said, I, I may want to try to get over there. You know, are you excited? How do you feel about this? And Alvin, just this perfect dead pound Alvin said, yeah, I'm really excited. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, but it's just it's processing. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, he was excited as Alvin gets, but he enjoyed it yeah. very much. Yeah. But in two signings now, rounding the corner have been three of our jurors from the case. Really? And I mean, I jump out of my, I jump up. I just am so happy to see these people because they made this happen. They made this story have a happy ending. Right. And Alvin will look at him and go, hey. <laughs> <laughs> here comes a cousin of his. Hey, here comes a, here comes a cousin of Virginia's who is saying very kind things about him. And he says, Hey, you know, it's just classic <laughs> Alvin that used to put people off. Yeah. That he wasn't fake gushing all over himself just to, for social, you know, etiquette sake. Yep. Uh, but now we're all kind of delighting in this honest approach and straightforwardness of Alvin Ridley. And and I, I think when he and I walked out of that courthouse, January 15, 1999, I, I didn't have anything prepared, but I just said, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Alvin Ridley, a free man and an innocent man. And I added a man who is ready to rehabilitate his reputation. And that's really what this book was about. I could quit forgetting parts of the story. As you could tell, it takes a while to unpack. Sure. And I would ruin wedding receptions and nights out by corralling a dozen people and spending 90 minutes telling them this story. They, they were delighted to hear, but the hosts were often quite upset with me. So now I can just say, Get the book. That's right. You can get the book. But, you know, you, you bring up something else interesting about this. And, and as we start to wrap up here today, McCracken, you didn't just <laughs> ruin re recept wedding receptions or anything like that. You essentially ruined your own life through this. I mean, well, you, my life was ruined already through. And I get quite personal in the book. This was not anticipated. But as I wrote I started explaining myself and it was like therapy. Um, I explored the fact that I have, I had a very wonderful, sweet and loving dad, but he was pitifully alcoholic. Mm -hmm. I had never talked about that in public before. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure it was a little known secret, you know, a well-known secret. Uh, for anybody that knew us, but he was extremely high functioning. He was a foundryman in Chattanooga. He had responsibilities at work and he gave his best at work. When he was all coffeeed up and at home, he would drink. He was never angry with us, never abusive toward our mother or us. He was just a sad drunk that was drinking every day until he fell asleep sometimes with a lit cigarette in his hand, you know, when there are a lot of burns on the side of the chair yeah. from that cigarette burning down. Yeah. And um, when you 
when you're a child, especially with a loving father, I could never hate him. I could never blame him. So a child turns inward. So what am I doing that makes him want to drink this much? What am I doing that makes him not want to go to my events and, and ball games and stuff like that, to, that he gets so drunk that we don't want him there. Right. And uh, that's what created the neurotic micromanager that I very often am. My secretary reminds me now I've put a label on it. Everybody goes up oh, micromanaging, <laughs> you know, there you go again. And I do. And it's, I, I got to tell you, it's one of the reasons I think the book is so was so successful in pre-sales Mm-hmm. Because I wouldn't let anybody get away without, you know, hey, there's a there's a QR code there if you want to go ahead and order it now. Yeah, you, you know, you want to go ahead and order it now? Why not? You know, it'll help and uh, it, it'll help boost the numbers and and so uh, so I, you know, it, it's like everything else in life. Out of tragedy and out of things that you, you would never want to be, good things can grow mm-hmm. from those things. My my micromanaging ways probably led to what successes I did have. Uh, it also probably caused some of my defeats that I did have, but the unanswered prayers, and that's also mentioned in the book, the unanswered prayers sometimes are the best. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be in Congress. I got a better life. I got to help Alvin Ridley. And that gave me a second act as a criminal defense lawyer, I hadn't done much of that before. I was screwing around in politics for a decade of my first decade of practicing law. Now, suddenly I had a, a law office and a big win and people start coming to you. Hey, I like what you did. Well, before you know it, forensic files, American justice, people magazine, uh, NPR snap judgment, they all love this story, but none of us could explain Alvin. And that was why I struggled with writing it Yeah. until his autism diagnosis. And it was a juror in the case that suggested that to me. Wow. And because she had become a nurse and she said, I think he has all the aspects of, of autism spectrum disorder. So with Alvin's permission, we got in it. We did an Atlanta trip and got lunch and went by and, and Alvin was uh, given a, 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 you know, extensive evaluation and uh, there's all kind of axis and uh, codes of where one plots out, but he's very much in the spectrum. Mm-hmm. And it, it's fascinating to me because in many ways, he's one of the smartest people I've ever met. Um, but he will obsess on something that he just can't let go. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. But, you know, it, it's... Yeah, I mean, Alvin is Alvin. And, and he's, he's at a point in his life where, you know, he'll, he'll continue to be who he is for the rest of his natural God-given life. And... and and who he is actually is going to change, I think, a lot of who people are. You know, I think he's going to open up a lot of eyes and ears to what autism is. Yeah. And uh, and I'm hoping the five and a half million people who have not been diagnosed that are still walking around. These are people who were, it wasn't discovered in school. Mm-hmm. And yet they are prone to having misunderstandings with people on both ends of the criminal justice system. One, and we all know how tragic this can be, is when people are not understanding each other when they're in, in dealing with law enforcement. Right. If, if you know, uh, uh, they're telling a person, you know, get out of the car with your hands up and, and you know, the the, the subject says, oh, I got to have my cell phone. I don't go anywhere without my cell phone. And they grab something. Yeah. Um, to the other end of this cycle, I know a lot of judges who just sometimes punish because of an attitude they think they're 
perceiving. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes a person on the spectrum who is not really understanding what you're saying, they could look quite bored when right. you're talking to them. Right. Or they could stare at you like, oh, man, I hate your guts. They're not hating your guts. Right. They're just trying to process what the hell are you talking about? Right. And and it's coming off as cold and, and uh, you know. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Well, one, so, one, so anyway, one last ahead. One last question for you here, McCracken, before we leave people. And, and that's this. And it's a little bit of an introspective question for you. And that is through getting... Alvin diagnosed with autism, you say you're a bit of a micromanager. Has it done anything to diagnose yourself or, or get yourself through your issues? Uh, or, well, or your... the writing, writing the book was cathartic. Mm -hmm. uh, I will tell you that uh, I don't want to give too much away in the book, but sure. uh, we, we, we intervened with my father during the time I was advising Alvin and put him in a hospital. And I write about that. Yeah. I kind of just from showing the reader, here's what I'm going through while I'm trying to figure this guy out. And, but it wasn't until I was writing this story, the book that I realized, of course, this is why I'm the way I, and so I started studying children of alcoholic parents and the different ways, uh, the different personality types. Well, my sisters and all all plot out on that scale. Um, but again, with a loving, loving parents that stayed together for 70 years mm -hmm. until my father died. And then my mother died 10 years later. So even in the best idyllic situations, uh, you know, not having your parent for those key moments, it can affect you and it can, you, you turn inward and, you're wondering, well, how can I keep this from happening? How can I keep things really calm at home? I'm going to make sure, you know, I mow the yard in time. I'm going to make sure that, you know, I, I, I was so worried about my dad mowing the yard while drinking that I insisted that, that he let me plant a bunch of free state pine trees so I could have a little forest. And I was really just trying to make a treacherous side of a hill, you know, that he wouldn't get on it on a riding lawnmower or a tractor. Right. Um, so, you know, as I was reading about adult children of alcoholic parents and identifying myself, I remembered Alvin in the courtroom one day saying, your daddy's here. Well, it sent a shock wave because my dad didn't come to my things. And here I am 39 years old and I'm excited like a, little league player who realizes his dad is in the stands, but I'm also horrified thinking, what if he's off the wagon? And I went over to see him, hug him, see my mother. He was good. And he came back for the rest of the trial uh, for three days. And when I was, uh, I've got a bunch of pictures in this book and a bunch of trial photos mm -hmm. and, um, the Chattanooga Times Free Press was a newly merged paper um, the week before our trial. So their archives, including unused photo negatives, are in, I learned, were in the Chattanooga Hamilton County Public Library, where I found three photos of my dad with Alvin. Really? Oh, my gosh. Wow. I, I had to put them in a book. Yeah. So yeah. there's uh, at least one of them made the print version and others made the uh, electronic version. But I do want to mention something to your readers. Sure. I've already dealt with two fake books that were writing on the name of this book. What? Two artificial intelligence written book, one out of Nigeria and the other one. I've gotten both of them removed from Amazon. There is another book that's still out there. It's a legitimate book, but it's our story that's been fictionalized without telling us. And that's fine and good because I gave away the story to everybody. But I finally, the author finally did put, okay, inspired by actual events. 
But but she also took the name, which I had given New Line Cinema when they were talking about a movie project. But I retained literary rights and naming rights. So just saying, make sure you get the right one. That is Alvin and Virginia from a photo booth. At, really? at a little amusement park in my in my county. Oh my god! And that's them kissing on the cover. That's an so am- it is a book about death, love, and redemption. That's an amazing because cover. Because there's a lot of redemption in this book, and in, in my community, my whole community is redeemed. Uh, all the players against Alvin, they really kind of redeemed themselves over the years. The coroner that was kind of the nemesis of the trial. She had Alvin over for Christmas dinner last Christmas. Oh my God! To to his to her house. That's wonderful. And so it's it's really a, a wonderful story in that respect for our community's sake. It's been very healing toward me. You know, you you stay a little pissed off after you get beat so badly in a congressional race that it's not even close. It's not even. It was just humiliatingly bad. But I figured God had better plans for me, and they were to be in Ringgold, Georgia, uh, in in October of 1997 when Alvin Ridley needed me. And I don't know if I think I put this in the book, but I would get so frustrated with Alvin, and I would say, "Why did you pick me? Why were you stalking me on the street? What's the deal?" You know, it's not because I was 13 and you fixed my TV, or that you went to school with my sister. What What's the deal? He would say, I'll tell you later. I'll tell you later. Well, at the very end of the trial, I said, now this is, we're about to wrap this up. So he said, well, I'll tell you next time I see you. And the next time he came, he brought a VHS cassette tape. And on the, the paper part of the cassette had been taped over. Things been taped over. Part of the, it had been ripped away. But here's my name in Virginia's handwriting. Wow. And he says, you can't have it, but I'll let you watch it. So I popped it in the VHS player, which every lawyer had one in the late 90s uh, in my office. And it was a very grainy recording of the one televised congressional debate. And Alvin said, she liked you. And so in the Alvin world, if somebody likes you, you like them. Yep. And, and so, uh, when he said that, that made me realize why he stalked me on the street. And I feel very fortunate that he did. You were worth your weight in gold, my friend. Although it was an ordeal. (laughs) Let me tell you, it was an ordeal and everything humorous in this book, Mm -hmm is at my expense. <laughs> That's true. It is. And much. Everything is. But I've, I've had a lot of people say, and look at the reviews. Mm-hmm. Look at the reviews. Amazon, Goodreads. Uh, I'm trying to get everybody to also go to Barnes & Noble just to get hit the big ones. Yep. But in, in the same paragraph, very often are laughter and tears. Yeah. And that's how people process this book. And I feel very fortunate. Well, it is an excellent book, and I really do hope, even if it's not New Line, I hope some movie company picks this up because I think this would be an excellent movie. I really not do. gonna jinx it. Not gonna jinx no, it. No, no, not not <laughs> In fact, I just knocked on wood. Um, so there you go. Uh, Zenith Man, Death, Love, and Redemption in a Georgia Courtroom. We have a link in the description of this program. Go get it right now. McCracken, Poston Jr. Thank you so much for being with us today on True Crime Tuesday. Thank you, Tim. And thanks to everybody listening. Please read my book. There you go. Folks, it's time now for us to lighten things up a little bit. It's time now for Dumb Crimes and Stupid Criminals. It's, it's Crayon News Story Time. What happened with this dude, Christ Bearer? I heard he uh, cut his penis off and then jumped off a balcony. Suspect pulls gun from butt, shoots twice at Denver police. What is your emergency? Uh, I need help. And what's the problem? I'm too high. You're too high? 
Yeah. The sound of the guy going, yeah, means that it's time now for us to start. It's time for Dumb Crimes and Stupid Criminals. I'm your host, Tim Dennis. Right over there is the intelligent, the very funny, the, let's just say a lot more beautiful than I am, Jessica Freeberg. Hi, Jessica. How are you? I'm great. I'm going to argue with all of that. Though. Oh, come you on. You are so beautiful, Tim. Oh, come on. There's a reason I've been doing uh, radio and podcasting for over 30 years, Jess. Nobody wants to see my face. I tried for TV many, many times, and they said, you've shattered many a lens, Mr. Dennis. We can't afford another one, especially now with the big uh, HD cameras. I'm just saying. They're, uh, they're way too expensive. Yeah, those expensive. are expensive to replace. <laughs> you know, I was only on TV that one time, and the network fired me right away. I'm just saying. That's, uh, yeah. No, just their loss. I saw you. You were amazing. Nah, I don't know about that. I'm not fishing for compliments here, Jess. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, dumb, dumb crime, stupid criminals today, Jess. Boy, okay. Oh, so I'll tell you this much. Last week, for some reason, I think people thought you were going to be on because uh, yeah. they love your robust sense of humor. They love the fact really? that. You, oh yeah, they love the fact that you can get just about as down as dirty, down and dirty as I can. <laughs> so they flooded me with these disgusting dregs of humanity that were doing lewd and lascivious things in, in different restaurants and things like that. Oh, no. <laughs> so then Mally, Mally uh, did Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals, and she said, what the? Because we had about six stories of people doing weird and disgusting things in public, right? Yeah, and it's all my fault, huh? Sorry, guys. No, it's okay. Sorry, Mally. That's okay. Hey, it was great. It was a great episode of Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals. This week is no exception. Wonderful. I'm excited. So, yeah. So, we've got a, let's just say, a robust, not safe for work uh, part of Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals. We do have four safe for work. <laughs> so, if you're listening at work, <laughs> be prepared to put your earbuds in. So we'll start it out with this, Jess. Here's the deal. We're starting out with Florida, man. So it's we're starting off on the right foot. Yes, I love it already. There you go. A Florida man calls an American Airlines passengers group blue-eyed white devils and threatens to take this plane down. We're starting. Wow. Oh, yeah, we're starting off hot. <laughs> what is it with some people that they can't travel on planes i don't know that's terrifying though to be on a plane with someone who's losing their mind it is yeah yeah I, you know amtrak is always the way to go if you think that you you can't do it and there's always greyhound yeah that's a good idea i my my oldest my son is terrified of flying and it's really hard for us to get him to go anywhere i never thought about throwing his but on a plane or a train, pardon yeah, me, a train. No, no, not a plane, not a plane, Jess, not a plane. <laughs> I usually just threaten to drug him. I'm like, there's medicine. We can give him something, make him go to sleep. <laughs> a, a bus, a train. I mean, you know, it's it's so many options other than drugs. What our, a great idea. Our president's always pushing trains. I mean, why not trains? I mean, you know, <laughs> they need the they need the business. Just That's so. right. Yeah. 29-year-old Shalil Patel was arrested on two counts of battery and one count of disorderly intoxication as he <clears throat> threatened the blue-eyed white devils. Mm -hmm. A Florida man on an American Airlines flight was put in a headlock, removed from the aircraft, and arrested after he called fellow passengers blue-eyed white devils and threatened to take the plane down with all you motherfuckers on it. Pardon my <laughs> language, but you've really got to hit the, you got to hit the, you know, got to hit the post on that deal when you. Seems fair. Doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, pardon my language, but th that's what he said. That's a direct quote. What are you going to do? You got to report yeah, the news. You do. Yeah. You never hear any of the major newscasters. You don't hear... You know, you don't hear uh, what's his name on NBC yelling motherfuckers, though, do you? That's right. Tim, that's why they come to us. That's right. That's why they come here. They want the pure, raw, unadulterated news from us. That's right. And that's yes. what they're going to get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 29-year-old <laughs> Shalil Patel was drunk when he boarded the flight from Tampa to Philadelphia on Tuesday and began antagonizing passengers, calling flight attendants names and threatening passengers and aggressively moving through the aircraft, court documents show. 
The report stated that he was acting hostile after he boarded and began acting erratically, yelling and cursing at the passengers. Patel called passengers blue-eyed white devils and threatened to take this plane down with all you mother effers on it. Okay, I can't do it another time, Jess. I just, I got the, you know, I, I think they got the Jess the first time. They got it, they got it. Yeah. He also accused, is accused of slapping a passenger on the hand and face and spitting on them. Well, you know. Ew. You know, you got to just sometimes in order to make a statement, you got to put the exclamation point, explanation point. Yes. Good God. <laughs> There's my white trash coming out. Uh, <laughs> the exclamation point on it. Right. That's right. I mean, with a little spit. That's right. A little spit, little slap on the hand and face. You got to pow, pow, you know. You got to put pow, a little, pow. as we used to say in the old country, you got to put a little pimp on it. Right. <laughs> Well, oh, I love it. That's what old Shalil Patel was doing. Video footage of the incident showed Patel yelling an anti-Semitic slur. Oh, that's bad form. Bad form. Yeah, don't like it. Yeah, at a flight attendant before he was put in a headlock by a fellow passenger and removed from the aircraft. Yes, I like that passenger. See? See? There's still people who willing to, to, you know, get their cojones up and, right. and help out. I'm trying to get to my home country, and you people made it harder for me to get to my home country. He was heard yelling at one point in the video. Well, if you just sit down and shut up, you're going to get there. You're on your way, man. Yeah, you're in, you're in the seat, right? You're making it hard for yourself. That's right. If you're in the seat, you just sit down. You're quiet. Maybe put on some headphones. I don't know. Just sit back. Close your eyes for a bit. The plane's going to take off. You're in the air. You're on your way. Take a little sleepy night night. There you go. A flight attendant used the aircraft's public address system to ask if any off-duty police officers were on board who could help restrain Patel. Police said six off-duty law enforcement officers stepped in and took him off the plane. Prior to departure of American Airlines Flight 2506 with service from Tampa to Philadelphia. Oh, of course, they're going to Philly. That's why this guy was a little rowdy. I think it was a rowdy flight, Jess. Uh, law enforcement was requested to the aircraft due to a disturbance in the cabin involving a dis disruptive customer. American Airlines said in a statement, uh, we thank our team for their professionalism and apologized to our customers for the inconvenience. The flight had a 30-minute delay because of the incident. Well, that had to make the rest of the passengers just jolly. That's not how you make friends. No. And they're all going to Philly. So, you know, they were all just nice and calm and didn't say a thing because they were delayed for right. 30 minutes. Right. Well behaved, quietly mm -hmm. taking it like yeah. champs. Yep. Nobody, nope. nobody asked for airline miles or any compensation or Demanded anything like that. Demanded it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Patel was arrested on two counts of battery, one count of disorderly intoxication. He's being held at the Hillsbury County, Hillsborough County Jail. I wish it was a berry, but it's a borough uh, county jail on a $2,150 bond. Well, the joys of the East Coast, Jess, we go from American Airlines in a Philadelphia, Tampa to Philly flight to a man with a machete and a Tampa Wawa store. Of course, we go from one Florida Hi. yeah, landmark to another. Are you a big fan of the Wawa? I think we've talked about it before. Yeah, I've honestly never been to a Wawa, but it's fun to say. No? Yeah, no, never. Oh. You know, Wawa is an oasis in the land of crazy. Is it? It's just a real great grocery store? Or is it like a gas station no, no, grocery no. store combo? Or It's, it's a... It's a gas station that has the most wonderful little substation in the middle of it. It's not like a, it, it, it's, it's not, a, saying substation is not the right word. Um, it's got the most wonderful little fast food outlet in it that's got subs, yeah. hot subs, you know, hoagies, grinders, you know, that type uh -huh. of deal. You know, it's just wonderful. The sandwiches are out of this world. I was going to say, it's kind of how we feel about like a Casey's in Iowa, you know, being an Iowa girl. It was like everyone wanted to get the Casey's pizza. Casey's known for having really good yeah. pizza, like regular pizza and breakfast pizza is the bomb. Yeah. You guys are over the moon about Casey's. Yeah. Yeah. It's better than come and go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> for obvious reasons. Well, yeah. I, mean, uh, name. Uh, I don't understand it. Leaves a lot of people unsatisfied. You know what I mean there. <laughs> <Just saying. laughs> 
Uh, we go to Tampa, Jess, where one person was arrested after an alleged machete attack at a Wawa in Tampa over the weekend and left one person injured. According to the Tampa Police Department, officers responded to a Wawa store at 401 North Dale Mabry Highway on Sunday around 6.16 p.m. regarding a disturbance between two men. Video sent to Fox 13 by a viewer shows a man brandishing a machete outside the convenience store arguing with another man as the other man says to call the cops. In the video, a woman can be heard pleading with one of the men as a child sits between the two men in a stroller. No. That's, it got worse. Yeah, that's one of those <laughs> things where the kid in the stroller isn't going to put up its arms and go, stop. <laughs> I hope not, or it might not have arms later. Right, yeah, that's probably what's going to happen in Tampa. A photo sent by the viewer shows a gash on the arm allegedly sustained in the attack. Police said one person was taken into custody. Oh, dear God. I, I, you know, first of all, you're going down to the Wawa. I mean, they do make big sandwiches, but not the kind where you need a machete to cut them. Uh, you know, you probably can use a regular knife. Just saying. Right. Like, who even has a machete? That's so crazy to me how often that comes up in florida in particular it seems like well it's not like they have that big wild brush where you need to cut it down yeah. with a machete you're in the city right you don't get a machete for such city living that's right yeah I, I don't know maybe it's i don't know do you need machete in urban living how do you get around with it even like is he just like carrying it like openly like you can't fit it in your pocket Maybe he's got like one of those huge sheaths that hangs off his belt and he, I don't know, he, <laughs> but still, why do you need a scabbard for a, for a machete on your belt in the middle of the city? Don't. It's just wild. It's just Florida. That's all. It's just Florida. Well, let's go out of Florida for a brief moment. We're going to Lock Haven in Clinton County. I think this is either, this is either in Pennsylvania or North Carolina. A married couple has been sentenced after they tried to evict a tenant by entering the home with multiple guns and threatening the victim. <laughs> Not the way you want to tell somebody to leave the apartment. That's worse than an eviction notice on your door. It's a little over the top. You probably want to start bit. with just the notice on the door first and not <laughs> not with the gun play. Guns a blazing. <laughs> That's right. That's the Wild West way of doing it, I guess. <laughs> On Tuesday, 54-year-old William Laubscher was sentenced on charges of terroristic threats, simple assault, and firearms charges. 48-year-old Candy Laubscher was sentenced back in October on the same charges. According to Clinton County District Attorney's Office, in September of 2022, William and Candy, both of Lock Haven, attempted to evict their tenants from a rental property on German Road, Dunstable Township. Police say the couple entered the rental armed with three guns. Evidently, one wasn't enough, Jess. I, I don't know why. Including a 357 revolver, a Soviet-era SKS semi-automatic rifle carried by William, and a 380 pistol carried in a concealed holster by Candy. Wow, they came packing. Evidently, it was a big move. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, once they were inside the residence, the Laubschers allegedly confronted a 19-year-old woman who was unclothed in bed sleeping. Oh, my gosh. I, I think it was an unfair fight at that point. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Candy then screamed at the woman repeatedly and revealed her concealed gun before ultimately removing the pistol and waving it at the victim. I think you've made yourselves known. Meanwhile, police stated William fired at least five rounds from his rifle near the front entrance to the home in a further attempt to terrify and intimidate the victim. Oh, my God. I think they mean business, Jess. Yeah. The victim immediately called 911 and state police were dispatched to the scene. Law enforcement arrived on the scene and found the Laubshire still armed and placed them under arrest. Investigators learned the Laubshire's had started the eviction process in the magisterial district court, but they did not proceed with the process before choosing to enter the residence armed in September of 2022. So they, Wowzer. So they started the process, but thought, nah, guns are better. Like, this is taking too long. Yeah. 
After being convicted, the Laubschers remained on bail after claiming they needed to make arrangements for their pets. On the date of their scheduled sentencing, the pair did not appear in court. The two fled Pennsylvania and were caught in North Carolina on July 21st. William was sentenced to 20 to 84 months. Candy was sentenced to 144 months with parole eligibility after 26. So let me get this straight. You can straight up bum rush somebody with three loaded weapons, start shooting over somebody's head, and the most you're going to get is seven years? That's crazy. Six to seven years? Yeah, I guess. That Whoa. doesn't seem quite right. That's uh, that's nuts. And that's in Pennsylvania then. Wow. Okay. We'll switch gears a little bit here, Jess. We're getting pretty close to the not safe for work section of our program, believe it or not. Um, you remember John Lennon saying about instant karma, how instant karma is going to get you? Yes. Literally happened to an inmate in Hawaii. A Kauai inmate who is all 33 years old is injured in a hit and run shortly after he escapes jail. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I'm free. Wham. <Math. laughs> Not so free after all. Kind of like the Shawshank Redemption, only the opposite. Yeah, only the opposite. Exactly. Kauai officials say an inmate who escaped from the Kauai Community Correction, uh, Correctional Center was injured in an alleged hit and run on Kohio Highway. Officials said... Matthew J. Ornelas Jr., all of 33 years old, escaped from KCCC just after 1 a.m., but was hit shortly before 1.10 a.m. He was out for 10 minutes. <laughs> he breathed that sweet air of freedom, oh. Jess, for all of 10 minutes before wham! Oh, wow. And that was it. Uh, by what appeared to be a dark-colored vehicle heading towards Lehui. On the highway, the driver failed to stop to render aid and was last seen making a U-turn towards Kapa. Oh, man. It's richer that it, he got hit by someone who just, like, drove off, so the criminal got hit by a criminal. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, I'd stop, but, you know, I got things to do at one ten in the morning. He's probably... <laughs> like, he probably had one too many drinks. Yeah, he probably had too much to drink. <laughs> Correctional officers found Ornelas on the highway about 100 yards northeast of KCCC with serious injuries. So they went, oh, yeah, you just tried to escape, didn't you? Whoops. <laughs> you know, we can take Natural you, consequences. We can take you back to the jail and treat you if you'd like. <laughs> Kauai police arrived on scene following a 911 call, and Ornelas was taken by ambulance to Wilcox Medical Center, where he remains in serious condition. Ornelas is serving time for promoting a dangerous drug in the third degree. Police reports have been filed for both the escape and the alleged hit and run. The Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation has an initiated an investigation into the incident. Kauai police ask witnesses to call Officer Henshaw. I'll give you the number 808-241-1616 in case you have any tips. <laughs> like probably try not to run over inmates after they've escaped. That's a good tip. Yeah. That's a good tip. But yeah. here's my question. When they find the person, do they charge them or do they give them a reward? Because they kind of helped them. Maybe both. Yeah, I yeah, think so. That's yeah. fair. That's, uh, you know, that's a good question, Jess. I tell you what, we'll lead into our not safe for work edition with this story. And okay. I'll, I'll give everybody a fair warning. We'll give you a few seconds here to put your earbuds in, get the kids away from the listening device. If you are listening around children, I don't know why you'd be listening to this. Say if you're working at a daycare, I don't know, but <laughs> hey, why not? It's probably a bad choice. You probably shouldn't be working daycare if you're listening to true crime podcasts around the kids. Uh, you might want to have your license yanked for that. Um, <laughs> But here's the deal. We'll give you a five, four, three, two, one. We'll start the not safe for work stories now. This one just is about an underwear bandit who was caught by Pasco police in Florida in a hilarious capture. You had me at underwear bandit. I know, right? Underwear bandit. <laughs> uh, let's see. What's the byline on this one? The byline on this one was March... 25th. Oh, so literally this happened last night. 
Oh, wow. Late last night, so this would have been Sunday night, we're taping on Monday, at approximately midnight, the proprietors of CM Motors, located in Pasco, were alarmed to witness an individual amid a car theft attempt on their premises. The vigilant business owners observed the perpetrator smashing the windows of two Kia vehicles in an apparent bid to abscond with them. You know, Jess, Kia vehicles get a bad name because they're very easy to steal. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, uh, especially the uh, catalytic converters are easy to come off of them. And of course, you get a lot of money for the, you know, the copper and the the, uh, catalytic converters. Promptly responding to the call, Officers arrived on the scene just as the thief was maneuvering one of the stolen cars out of the lot, only to be thwarted by the strategic positioning of a Pasco police patrol car. Subsequently, the thief abandoned the vehicle and fled on foot into the residential neighborhoods north of 20th and Lewis, initiating a pursuit by law enforcement. Despite the thief's attempt to evade capture by traversing fences and navigating through numerous backyards, Officers maintained their pursuit and successfully cornered the suspect. Ultimately, the perpetrator was apprehended while hiding beneath a boat. Hmm. Not unusual for Florida. Astonishingly, the thief, identified as a 15-year-old juvenile from Pasco, was found wearing underwear and makeshift face covering. Hmm. Yes, you read that correctly, or you heard that correctly. I read it correctly. He was wearing underwear as a makeshift face covering. Hopefully, he didn't wear the brown streak towards his mouth. Hopefully, they were clean. Yes. Facing the consequences of his actions, the juvenile culprit was duly booked into juvenile detention on charges of two counts of attempted auto theft. Underwear as a face covering, Jeff. I have so many questions. Were they boxers? Whitey tighties? Like... (laughs) His his mom's thong. I'm just, yeah. you know, I mean, you got to have, you got to have enough eye space to be able to maneuver. That's true. Yeah. And if it was his mom's thong, was it the one she wore to the strip club to work that night? Or, I mean, <laughs> you know, they're all legitimate questions. Yes. I mean, so many questions. You should really ask those questions, especially in Pasco, in Pasco County, Florida, where anything can happen. And it's an interesting sidebar here, Jess. Sometimes we have to take the crime out of criminals and we have to look at the laws which apply to criminals. Yes. In this case, in New York, the average person could be a criminal. Really? That's right. Did you know, Jess, that cheating on your spouse is a crime in New York? Fair enough. I mean, we have all kinds of odd laws in, in every state. I didn't sti- know it was punishable by law, but it wow. Is. It is. In New York, cheating on your spouse is a crime in New York. The 1907 law may finally be repealed. Wow. It became a law in 1907 in New York. Here's the interesting deal. We go to Albany, New York where for more than a century, it's been a crime to cheat on your spouse in New York. There's a lot of people in New York that should be in jail right now, just saying. (laughs) (laughs) Probably some people sweating. They're like, what? That's right. I, for a fact, know probably about six people that should be in jail in New York right now. (laughs) Oh, no. I'm just saying. Don't name any names. No, 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 no. I'm no no stooge. I'm no stoolie. I'm not going. I'm not going up the river. Uh, But adultery may soon be legal in the Empire State thanks to a bill working its way through the New York legislature, which would finally repeal the seldom used law that is punishable by up to three months behind bars. Wow. You, How do you want to be the lady who throws that at her husband mm-hmm. when she finds out he's cheating on her? Right? Three months behind bars. Wild. Now, here's the deal. And, and this is what I'm wondering, Jess. I wonder if you go to court for divorce and you can prove that cheating has happened, can you get charged post-divorce proceedings for, for adultery? I don't know. That's a good question. It says here, adultery bans are still on the books in several states across the U.S., though charges are also rare and convictions are even rarer. They were traditionally enacted to reduce the number of divorces at a time when a cheating spouse was the only way to secure a legal split. 
Adultery, a misdemeanor in New York since 1907, is defined in state code as when a person engages in sexual intercourse with another person at a time when he has a living spouse or the other person has a living spouse. Just a few weeks after it went into effect, a married man and a 25-year-old woman were the first people arrested under the new law after the man's wife sued for divorce. That according to a New York Times article from the time. Interesting. Yeah. Only about a dozen people have been charged under the New York's law since 1972. So obviously they're not enforcing this thing. Yeah. Well, I bet a lot of people don't even know that it exists. Probably not, no. And of those, just five cases have netted convictions. So the chances that you're going to go up the river on this deal are, are pretty slim. Charles Levine, an assemblyman, sponsored the bill to appeal this ban. The last adultery charge in New York appears to have been filed in 2010 against a woman who was caught engaging in a sex act on a public park, but it was later dropped as part of a plea deal. Levine says it's time to throw out the law, given that it's never enforced, and because prosecutors shouldn't be digging into what willing adults do behind closed doors. It just makes no sense whatsoever, and we've come a long way since intimate relationships between consenting adults are considered immoral, he said. It's a joke. The law was someone's expression of moral outrage. Catherine B. Silba, a law professor at Boston University who co-authored A Guide to America's Sex Law, says adultery bans were punitive measures aimed at women intended to discourage extramarital affairs that could throw a child's parentage into question. Let's just say this, patriarchy, Silva said. New York's bill to repeal its ban has already passed the Assembly and is expected to soon pass the Senate before it can move to the governor's office for a signature. So there you go. You really taught me something today. Just an interesting side note that... So it can be dumb crimes, stupid criminals, idiotic laws. We'll add that yeah. to the <laughs> to the end of our, our show title today. But yeah, there you go. <laughs> Adultery is still a crime in New York, at least for now. Crazy. At least for now. All right. We're firmly into dumb crimes, stupid criminals right now, into the not safe for work part of our program. Last week, Jess, you missed the you missed the high tide, so to speak, of dumb crime, stupid criminals, as we were talking about a man who worked at a Safeway in Colorado, and it brought up really bad memories of uh, the fact that when we were staying at the Stanley Hotel, when both uh, Mally and I were staying at the safe or at the uh, Stanley Hotel, there's a Safeway just right down the road yeah. from the Stanley, and that's where you basically get your provisions, right? When you're staying at the Stanley. Well, there was one of Fort Collins where one of the men who worked at the Safeway was, <clears throat> I'm going to put this in a very adult way, ejaculating into the produce and other sealed items. No. And unsealed items. And he was doing it quite often. In fact, there were tens, almost hundreds of people affected by this. No. And they have him on video doing this. Oh, I'm throwing up in my mouth right, right now. Right, right. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, my God, I never want to go to a Safeway again. And then I thought about it. Wait a minute. How many times did I go to the Safeway? Yeah. Ugh. When we were in Colorado. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> I can't trust anything anymore. I know, right? All right. So we're going back to another restaurant that you may be familiar with or actually love, Chipotle. <laughs> We're talking about more lewd acts by another fast food worker. Don't ruin Chipotle for me. Sorry. Sorry, okay. dear. Okay. Chipotle manager admits to lewd acts in the restaurant in its dining room, cops say. At least it's in the dining room. Better than back in the kitchen. <laughs> By the way, I'm going to give you a little shot of the manager here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Just so people know what we're laughing at, the manager's taking a selfie of himself in the man, and he's a young kid. He looks 12. Yeah, he looks like he's 12, and he's sticking his tongue out, and he's giving the peace sign into a mirror, <laughs> and he's crossing his eyes. It looks hilarious. A Chipotle manager exposed himself and masturbated in the dining room of a Pennsylvania Ew. restaurant. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> According to police who say that a female victim felt three squirts of liquid hit her jeans. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> no. Extra guac for you, Jess. <clears throat> When she got up to leave the table where the man had been alleg allegedly pleasuring himself. Oh, dear God. Oh, Lord. Following the March 1st incident at the eatery in Camp Hill, which is a Harrisburg suburb, two men went to the local police station to report a sexual assault, according to a March 18th complaint. The women, one of whom was a former Chipotle employee, detailed an encounter with Kaisim Ransom, the 26-year-old manager. That kid is 26. 26. He literally looked like a baby. And he looked like he was 14. Yeah. Uh, the duo told cops they were seated at a communal table talking with Ransom and other employees when Ransom began doing something with his hands down his crotch. Oh, gosh. Is that just a lack of social skills? What, what did, Have you ever sat around a table where a guy just starts fiddling with himself? <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. Oh, Lord. What is wrong with people these days? Many things. One of the women said she saw Ransom touching his penis outside his pants, recalling that she was in denial and looked away. Would so you, no one said anything? No. W wouldn't you just say, what in the hell are you doing? You would definitely say something. Would you throw chips at him or something? <laughs> I'd probably put him in a headlock like the people on the airplane. Throw your drink at him? I mean... Something. Yeah. <sighs> I'm confused. This story confuses me. Uh, subsequently, she also brought one napkin. Oh, no. Okay, so let me start this again. The woman added that Ransom grabbed new... Oh, my God. This gets worse, Jess. Okay, so one of the women said that she saw Ransom touching himself outside his pants, recalling that she was in denial and looked away. The woman added that Ransom grabbed numerous napkins and placed them down by his penis and subsequently brought one napkin up from his crotch and placed it on the table. What? She said the napkin was sticking to itself. Oh, my gosh. And people were just like sitting at the table with him and nobody said anything. How do you wow. not slap this kid upside the head? Flip the table and get away from him. Right. Break a chair over his head. Right. The second woman reported noticing Ransom moving his hands a lot down around his penis, adding that she could see him jacking off. That's a direct quote. Uh -huh. When the former Chipotle worker got up to leave the table, she felt three squirts of liquid hit her jeans, the complaint alleges. Yeah. You know, sour cream is extra at Chipotle, isn't it? I think, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, you have, to, you have to pay extra for that. During police questioning, Ransom reportedly confirmed the incident in verbal and written statements. He was charged yesterday with multiple misdemeanors, including indecent assault, uh, open lewdness, and indecent exposure. Ransom was suspended from Chipotle, and if he has not been already, is expected to be fired. Ransom is pictured... I should hope so. <laughs> right? It's not one of those slap on the wrist, and if it was, he probably enjoys it. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah. yeah. Ugh. All right, let's move on. <laughs> we'll go from pleasuring yourself to receiving pleasure elsewhere. A bus driver is caught receiving oral sex in his high-vis jacket beside a double-decker bus. We're going across the pond. Something about Damn. public stuff. I don't know. Public stuff, Jess. I know. it's this. The show is just degraded into how much stuff can people get caught doing outside, uh, evidently. So bad. I know. This, this story actually has a warning explicit content on it. <laughs> the whole last half of this episode. I should. guess, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
A bus driver allegedly was caught in a sex act near a double decker in Sprouston, Norfolk, across the pond. And he had safety on his mind as he reportedly kept his high vis kit on while his pants came off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear God. A bus driver appeared to be practicing a form of safe sex when he was allegedly busted with his pants down next to a double decker while still wearing his high vis. A first bus driver was wearing his high visibility jacket and was allegedly caught receiving oral sex next to the vehicle last Friday night of what he believed to be Atlantic Avenue in Sproston, Norfolk. The incident was made public when an anonymous user posted a photo to Facebook. What Don't those normally get banned? Oh. This just keeps getting worse. It does, which appears to capture the alleged incident. <laughs> I think they normally ban those, don't they? Uh, I don't think they could stay on long. I think it would be taken down, right? You would think. I hope. Police are now investigating it as an offense of outraging the public decency. At least that. A, yeah. Nor a Norfolk police spokesperson said, we are aware of an incident of outraging public decency in Sproston after an image was circulating on social media over the weekend. By the way, just, just between you and me, this is the... This is the photo that appeared. Oh, no. <laughs> on, on sure Facebook. enough, there yeah, it is. There it is. That's the man in his high vis. You know what? I, I can mean, act. if he would have taken that coat off, he would have been less conspicuous. This is this is it blurred out right here. <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> and he could have like hid behind the bus. He's like right out in front of it, like an idiot. Yeah, anybody can see him driving by. Yeah, almost like he wanted to be caught. <laughs> He's like, "Would you like to see my Jolly Roger?" Yeah, he's yeah. like, hold on, we got to move up here where everyone can see us. And oh, let me put my coat on so I'm more, you know, obvious to the world. Well, the thing is, is the person, you know, given the Hummer is wearing a high vis jacket, too. <laughs> Does she work for the bus, too? I think he just wanted them both to be safe. Well, that's what he didn't want to get hit by a car on the side of the road. That's right. <laughs> The incident occurred on Atlantic Avenue between 9 p.m. and 10 p.m. on fr Well, they were out in the dark, Jess, is what it was. They wanted to both be safe. On March 22nd, which was Friday, when two people appeared to be engaging in sexual activity whilst in public, uh, officers are keen to speak to the person who took the photo as a key witness. <laughs> 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 Probably because they want to know how many pictures they got. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, officers are keen to speak to the person who took the photo as a key witness. A first group east of England spokesperson added the matter was under investigation. The bus driver isn't the only person to have been recently busted in the act. A woman feeling frisky in Bogota was also busted when she decided to give her fellow oral sex in public park in the middle of the okay. day. A lot of what, in the middle of the day? Yeah, a lot of people just deciding to, you know... Well, nature is nature. What is wrong with people? Getting getting back to nature, I guess, Jess. Wow. Yep. I guess the cheeky couple got hot and heavy on Friday, March 15th, as onlookers walked by. The pair were sitting on the grass under a tree when the woman started to unzip her man's trousers and just do it right there in broad daylight. People could see them as they walked past, but the couple didn't stop their brazen acts there after they finished pair quickly left the park in Bogota, Colombia, not before someone filmed them in the act from a building nearby. Wow. Did they get busted? So, uh, evidently not. Doesn't say they got oh. caught. Yeah. But this bus driver's in for uh, some trouble. I would say. Just in case you thought the restaurant shenanigans were over. Over? Oh, <laughs> Nobody no. says it's what, over until we What are you going to ruin for me is. now? Are you a big fan of the Popeyes? I do like a little Popeyes. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, I like the red beans. Not and, anymore, though. I like the red beans and rice and jambalaya. Yeah, it's good stuff. It is. Do you like it so much you want to grab somebody and just do them right there? <laughs> <laughs> it's like I, an aphrodisiac. Yeah, a little bit. You know <laughs> kind of enticing i'm just saying well we go to florida jess where evidently <laughs> the popeyes is so good it's it's fucking good 
I'm <laughs> just saying. Oh, that was good. That was good, Tim. A couple was arrested Saturday afternoon for having sex on the sidewalk in front of a Popeye's in plain view of passing motorists. Wow. Just right there on the sidewalk. Right there on the sidewalk. I mean, wow. First of all, concrete. Yeah, yeah, it's a little rough. Yeah, a little, little rough. Responding to a report of lewd behavior, a sheriff's deputy located two suspects trysting on a patch of grass across from the Vero Beach restaurant, which is directly adjacent to U.S. Highway 1. Oh, well, at least they were in the grass, not on the concrete. So there's that. And you have an audience. Yeah. How do you want to be the police officer getting that call? <laughs> right. <laughs> you might want to bring the fire hose. <laughs> <laughs> According to arrest reports, the cop spotted, oh my, 70-year-old Arnold Mackey. Oh, go Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> that changes everything. <laughs> With his balls swinging down by his knees like the Liberty Bell. He's Ma like, what do I have to lose? <laughs> <laughs> you ready for another go, girl? Yeah, let's go. Making a thrusting motion while on top of 44-year-old April White. What? This is one science, wow. e science experiment you want to keep away from the kids, I think. <laughs> you just want to. <laughs> oh, April. Uh, this is when octogenarians get loose. <laughs> one of those videotapes. I think I saw this overnight during a Springer rerun. You can order it for nine ninety five online. <laughs> when confronted by Deputy Eric Brashears, who went blind around two p.m., <laughs> 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 the duo began adjusting their shorts. He said, "Mackie, the cop noted, appeared flustered and was unable to fully pull his shorts up, which left his penis fully exposed to oncoming traffic." <laughs> Well, I hope he had something to be proud of. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Oh, sorry. Claiming she had done nothing wrong, White reportedly struggled with the cop and called him <clears throat> an F word. Mm hmm. Yeah. Suggesting yeah. he might be gay. Yeah. Oh, Just oh. Saying. Yeah. And other obscenities as he sought to restrain her. White, who smelled of alcohol, of course, and was escorted to the Shocking. ground. Yes. <laughs> was escorted to the ground where police found four empty bottles of vodka and an un unopened bottle of rum. She was working on her fifth bottle today. Wow. Yeah. A motorist who called 911 after spotting the duo said... He did a double take because he couldn't believe what he was seeing. The witness added that the female had her legs spread open and the male was inserting his fingers inside the female in full view of traffic. Well, Jess, if you can't perform for an audience, who can you perform for? I mean, come on. You know, it's the old... In front of a Popeye's. Yeah, in front of a Popeye's. I mean, that's the old actor's credo, isn't it? <laughs> After being read as rights, Mackey reported reportedly said it was not his intention to expose himself and that he had asked White to leave the side of the road, but she refused. <laughs> well, it's, who's to blame then? I mean, he tried to get her to go somewhere else. Yeah, you get it where you can get it, you know? Recognizing that he was in plain view of passing motorists, Mackey said that he would apologize to the judge. <laughs> to make everything all better. That's right. Both White and Mackey were arrested uh, for exposure of sexual organs, a misdemeanor. White was also charged with re resisting arrest and disorderly intoxication. Both remain behind bars with White's bond set at $7,000, while Mackey needs to post $5,000. <laughs> Let me uh, show you a picture of the amorous okay. couple. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, oh. something to feast your eyes on there, Jess. They're a cute couple, for Aren't sure. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe the two of them actually got it on in the grass right next to Popeye's. 
So there you go. Love that chicken at Popeye's. Love that chicken at Popeye's. And finally, on today's Dumb Crime, Stupid Criminals. You know, when you go to New York, Jess, you can find all kinds of bootleg stuff on the street. Yeah, for sure. That's right. Well, one New York City firm is accused of sex toy bootlegging. What? <laughs> That's right. Uh, you can get all kinds of knockoff stuff. You can get knock knockoff DVDs. You can get knockoff uh, handbags. You can get knockoff whatever, Jimmy Choo shoes. <laughs> but don't ever get that dildo that's a knockoff because you could get it knocked off right in your old orifice if you'd like. <laughs> no. <laughs> There's a lawsuit out there that fantasy-themed items have illegally been knocked off. A manufacturer of fantasy-themed sex toys has accused an upstart Brooklyn, New York th uh, firm of knocking off its, its distinctive designs, according to a federal lawsuit alleging that the defendant has infringed on copyrights for dildos such as Spritz the Sea Dragon and Tyson the Water Buffalo. Whoa, gosh, <laughs> there's something I never thought about before. You have to go and like get a trademark for your dildo company and your products. <laughs> Yes. Can you imagine filling out the paperwork for that and taking it in and being like, oh, well, it's been done. <laughs> <laughs> and we're about to find out about it. Oh, man. In a March 20th complaint filed in U.S. District Court in Arizona, Bad Dragon Enterprises contended that its sculptural products have been illegally copied by Sin Saint, which is headquartered in a Coney Island warehouse and advertises that it's that all its ethically manufactured toys are made in Brooklyn, USA. Bad Dragon, which noted that it has had significant commercial success in the adult toy field, alleged that Sin Saint has been selling the duplicative dildos, it's hard to say, through its website and other trade channels, including the recent AVN Adult Expo, in Las Vegas, where the new firm's exhibitor booth was next to that of the all-nude Palomino Strip Club. <laughs> this just gets worse and worse. The lawsuit identifies 13 separate dildos that Bad Dragon claims have been copied and renamed by Sin Saint, which was incorporated in New York last year. The colorful silicone toys feature scales, tentacles, suction cups, and other design elements meant to mimic the genitalia of dragons, sea creatures, and other fantastical characters. Wow. Did you know those were out there? No. I'm about to edumacate you, my friend. Oh, my goodness. I'm a boring human being. I never, <laughs> that thought never even crossed my mind. <laughs> Some of the Bad Dragon products that Sin Saint is accused of swiping are Kelvin the Ice Dragon, Stan the T-Rex, and Virgil the Drippy Dragon. No, names. <laughs> Sin Saint has not been accused of pirating other Bad Dragon offerings like Jason the Demogorgon or Cuttlefish of Cthulhu. Oh, no. According to the lawsuit, Sin Saint's counsel last month stated that the company has begun removing some of the allegedly infringing listings of product redesign. This response, Bad Dragon contended, was unacceptable, adding that it continues to be harmed by defendants' ongoing unlawful conduct. The Bad Dragon complaint seeks an order in joining Sin Saint from any continuing or from continuing any further alleged copyright infringement and seeks disgorgement of all defendants' profits related to the artificial penises. A line I never thought I'd read in my professional career. <laughs> and you did it with a straight face. Thank you. I appreciate that. The company may also seek statutory damages of up to $150,000 for each of the dildos in question. Another sentence I'd never think I'd read in all of my professional <laughs> career. For more than a decade, Bad Dragon has sought trademark and copyright protection for various product lines. While often successful, the firm's application to trademark its CumTube was abandoned after a government attorney rejected the ejaculating dildo because the applied for mark consists of or includes immoral or scandalous ma matter. Oh my gosh, and that's another thing I never thought of. The people at the trademark place have to like read through these and then grant trademark 
I'm just dying. Can you imagine? They're probably like all in suits and. <laughs> Can you imagine having to type this up, Jess? You're at the patent office and you go, oh, we have we have a, agreed to your application for the cum tube. <laughs> and then the guy going, gosh, I would have thought of that. I wish I would have yeah. thought of that. The application included a very not safe for work image, which can be found on the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office website. Yes, it's there, folks. Ask for it by name. Wow, sir. According to an August 2023 trademark application, Sin Saint's owner is Oleg Semenenko, who's all of 50 years old, a resident of Brooklyn's gated Seagate community. Semenenko lives less than a mile from Sin Saint's warehouse, which shares an address with Glob Marble, an industrial molds business for which Semenenko is listed as manager in a separate trademark application filed this month. In a brief interview today, Semenenko was asked how a dildo firm grew out of his original business. We work with rubber, he replied. Semenenko dismissed Bad Dragon's claim that its products were original and unique. How can octopus hand be your idea? Okay, it's at that point I break up. How can octopus hand be your idea? <laughs> Everyone's thought of this. Come on. Come on. I have not the first one to think of octopus hand. Oh, or someone getting off on it. Um, you know, actually, there's, I don't know, Jess, have you ever checked out any of the, the, any of the offerings on Vice, on the channel Vice? And especially uh, yeah. Yeah. the show Sex, Sex Before the Internet. Yeah. Okay. They actually do what, what the, the guy who came up with, I forget what it is, Doc Johnson. I think it's Doc Johnson Sex Toys or whatever. Mm -hmm. The way he came up with it was he bought a rubber molding company. The guy wow. who owned the rubber molding company was a, was a guy who was a magician and a ventriloquist. And he had owned it because he was making ventriloquist dummies. And that's the whole reason he owned this company. And then he made it into a sex toy company? The guy who bought it made it into a sex toy company. Well, oh. see, but see, the magician was making really crude sex toys as well. And that's how he made his living. But the guy who bought it from him said, you know what? I can make better sex toys and I can figure out a way to automate the process. So, because the guy who made the first sex toys, the magician, made really bizarre sex toys and kind of clunky sex toys, and the guy who came along from Doc Johnson said, you know what, I can make the best sex toys in the world. I know, we're getting way in the weeds with this deal. He's like, get out of here with those clunky sex toys. That's right. He's like, I'm going to make them sleek and put them in, in bubble packaging and put them so you can hang them on walls and people can see them. I know, but you can watch Vice and, and figure out exactly how that whole deal was made. But um, <laughs> why do I have this useless knowledge in my head? Because I'm a broadcaster. That's why. <laughs> and broadcasters need to know this useless stuff. Um, but yeah. Spritz the sea dragon, Tyson the water buffalo. Yeah. Duplicative dildos. <laughs> that sounds like a great band name wrote it on a piece of paper i gotta throw it away before my kids get home <laughs> <laughs> they're like mom what kind of kinky shit are you into <laughs> so there you go that wraps up dumb crimes and stupid criminals for today wasn't that fun to end it. i loved it see a little something to make you laugh after we got done talking about uh <clears throat> alvin ridley and the fact that he didn't kill his wife because she died from seizures. <laughs> we talked about that? Yeah, well, yeah, in the, uh, in the interview previously. Oh. <laughs> That's right. I was like, wait, did we talk about that? And I don't even remember it. Boy, it's been a long day. No, 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 not you. It, 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 you know, the interview previous. So, yeah. Nah. Yeah, we left you out of that one. Sorry. Didn't mean to. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't your fault. Not cool. Not cool to leave me out. No, no, no. I mean, we didn't mean to. But, you know, <laughs> I'm just saying. Just saying. Duplicative dildos. Duplicative dildos. Say it three times fast, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, coming to the First Avenue stage, duplicative dildos. <laughs>
And then you get this. You get, yeah, because, you know, people would, <laughs> they wouldn't cheer for a band named Duplicative Dildos. No. No, not at all. Do you have anything to promote? Oh, I just actually, I don't know if I have anything necessarily to promote, but I am celebrating. I actually just sent um, a finished manuscript to my publisher last night before I went to bed. Woo-hoo. Nice. There you go. So you're getting closer and closer to uh, releasing that book. Which, yeah, they'll come out come out in the fall of 2024. There you go. All right. Uh, we have a link in the description of this program so you can follow Jess at her website and you can follow all things Jessica Freeberg, including uh, events and uh, much, much more. So um, follow her on her website. So there you go. Um, tomorrow on the big show, it's Supernatural News. By the way, I got to tell you, Jess, before we leave people today, um, last week we had a listener who wanted to know when we could have you and Mally on the same show. And I oh, told him that'd be so fun. Well, it would be. I, but I told him at that point, keep your hands above your listening device at all times. So there you go. Um, <laughs> Cause I think at that point he wants me to disappear and just have the two of you on. And <laughs> he can, he can do whatever that guy at Chipotle did. I'm just saying, <laughs> um, but there you go. Uh, tomorrow we'll have supernatural news. And then uh, we have a surprise for you on Thursday. I love the prizes. Yeah, surprise on Thursday. So there you go. So that'll do it for uh, for Jessica Freeberg. I'm Tim Dennis. Thank you so much for joining us here, and uh, I want to thank our our guest as well for being on the program today. And again, you can find out more about Alvin Ridley by picking up the book Zenith May is the name of the book that we covered today. And I'm not going to spoil the ending for you, folks. I'm just not. But let's just say this would make a wonderful Hollywood movie. Mm. Yeah, so there you go. I'm going to have to read it. Zenith, man. It's a wonderful book. Uh, We'll see you tomorrow for Supernatural News. And thank you for listening to the best in true crime podcasting. This is True Crime Tuesday.